Hey, good afternoon. <coughs> so let's see, the uh, the midterms for the graduate section are done and posted. The undergrads are still not done, but at least there's some progress today. Uh, so that's most of the, I guess, majority of the class. Um, it, it is curved, and uh, there's a node on the D2L site now of the formula for the curve. Uh, you can go to the drop box for the midterm and see your, uh, your detailed scores. And if you click on the rubrics link, um, you can see exactly where points were taken off and notes on how come or whatever my notes were to you. Also, uh, on that site, it says what your raw score is and what your curve score is. Um, I curved it somewhat, not a huge amount, but somewhat, and I did it because I perceive this to be a somewhat hard test. Um, on the other hand, having said that, the, the scores were good, and I probably, you know, might not have curved it, frankly. Uh, there were more hundreds than anything else, and the, the uh, histogram was highest at 100, and it slowly decayed as you went to lower and lower scores. So it was hardly a bell curve centered at something. Uh, the average was 86, and I curved, which is a B. I curved that up to a B plus um, on the average, but there was a formula for, for doing it. Uh, so it didn't affect everybody in the same way. Um, so I think, you know, it was a hard class, or kind of a hard test. Um, some of the parts were easy and some of them were hard and required some logical leaps and thinking, uh, which did spread the scores out a little bit. Um, uh, but I think the class, the graduate students did well. Um, and we'll talk about the undergrads later. But, uh, Okay, um, second thing on problem 13.5, gotten some questions. So talk just a second about that. This is a, um, a permanent magnet. And you're supposed to um, work out the magnetic equivalent circuit model for a permanent magnet. Okay. So first thing you have to recognize is, is that this is a, just a single element that goes in a larger magnetic circuit that would have, in addition to the magnet, probably have cores and other things. So you're not modeling a complete closed magnetic circuit. You're, you're modeling one element that goes in a magnetic circuit. So if this is, say, a permanent magnet with north and south, then we can say there's flux, um, flux going through it, and there's some MMF across it. And this is going to translate into some equivalent circuit model that has two terminals. Okay, and so your job is to figure out what is the equivalent circuit model for this element. So, of course, there are, first of all, there are two terminals here with flux coming out and with MMF across it. And then what goes inside the box? Okay, so I think most of the questions related 
to this problem are really related to understanding what you know what am I, what's being asked for here and this is what's being asked for okay so you can assume that you know maybe there's something else some other circuit with other elements connected around this but you want to just model the the one element here the two terminals <coughs> Uh, do we have any other homework qu questions today? Yes. Um, for 13.2, for parts D and D, I'm confused what uh, the L plus and L minus are actually asking for. What's being asked for there in 13.2? So 13.2 has um, a core with two windings. And the first thing you do is find the uh, find the matrix equations. So um, this, there's two windings on this core. And some V1 and V2, I1 and I2, and with A and B you develop the reluctances and then you find some the terminal equations that are V1, V2 is equal to this inductance matrix times the derivative of I1 and I2. Okay, and then for C and D, you're asked to, to find the inductance that you would get if you connect the two windings together. So for C, it's suppose we took winding 1 and 2 and connected them in series like this. Find the inductance L plus between these two terminals where this is winding 1 that is v, has V1, and this is winding 2 that has V2. <coughs> so one way or another, suppose you connected the windings together like that, what would the inductance be? Now, you can solve this actually purely electrically. The total voltage is the sum of the two voltages, and they have the same currents. And so what, you know, if you work out just between these two terminals, what is the relationship between the current here, this total current, and this total voltage? V is going to be some inductance L plus times di dt. And so you're supposed to work out what that is. And then for part D, you're supposed to find L minus where you connect the windings up with the opposite polarity. Like this. So V1 is plus at the dot, V2 is plus at its dot, but they're in the opposite direction. And you should find that L minus is different than L plus. It matters which way you connect them. So does, I don't know, does that answer the question or? Yeah, I, I mean, so you're basically just solving are you just doing what you did in the first part, just but just solving for one winding? Like, are you just basically considering uh, the two windings in series now one winding and then solving? Um, well, you'll have trouble considering them as one winding because they are on different legs of the core. But so I would treat it electrically that you've already figured this out for the two windings separately. And now if you put them together, what is, electrically, what inductance do you get between these terminals? Okay. <clears throat> okay, any other questions?
the next problem, 13.4. Okay. Uh, we have a circuit that we're given in part D. And it says that it can be a sepic or a chook or any other. Uh, yeah, I think the circuit you're given is a chook. It's a chook, but the voltage polarity is a little different. Like normally it's like plus to minus. But then, you know, the we're, we're inverting for a chook. Right. So it just kind of gets a little confusing. Can we do it the other way? And then just state that we are. So I don't have the problem in front of me, but yeah. this is... Um, this is it. I will draw the voltages and things so that everything comes out positive. So the output voltage is actually negative, but we'll define it like that. So V out is a positive number. This then, this capacitor has a positive voltage in this direction that's actually VG plus V out because the magnetics are short circuits at DC, and so if you go around this loop, the voltage on this capacitor has to be equal to this plus this. Yeah, I was just and then, as far as the polarities on these, so this is a coupled inductor. We couple it like this. And actually, the way the current flows is that IG, positive IG goes that way, and positive I out is really going this way. So because it's an inverting converter, there's a lot of, it's easy to get confused on the polarities. Um, so then if we call this V1 of T, and we'll call it plus at the dot, and then this is V2 of T plus at the dot, um, by working out the steady state solution of the converter, you can find that V1 of T actually equals V2 of T in steady state. At least that's true to the extent that all the ripples are small. And so V1 of T works out to be the same as V2 of T. And it, it does this. <clears throat> and what's this saying? This is uh, Vg over D prime. with a minus sign. <clears throat> so when you, so what the converter does is the voltage waveform that it applies to the two inductor windings turns out to be the same. And this is not because this, these are, this is a transformer or anything, although once we couple the inductors it starts looking like a transformer but it's actually the property of the converter itself that even without coupling these things with just separate inductors you get the same voltage winding applied to both pieces of magnetics and that then suggests that we could couple them and wind them on the same core if you give it a one to one turns ratio or something really close to that then the transformer equations are not violated so why not just put them on the same core and you have one magnetic element instead of two? Okay. Now the currents add. IG flows into the dot. I out flows into the dot. And so you're not getting the currents canceling or any kind of magic like that. The, this inductor has to withstand, has to not saturate when you put full current into both dots from both of these. And the magnetization of the core really comes from the sum of the two currents. But there's one element instead of two, one piece instead of two. Now, the problem goes further than that, though. It turns out that by controlling the leakage inductances of these two windings, you can actually get the current ripple in one of the windings to cancel out if you do it right. And so what this parts C and D are after um, is, is to say, how can you design this magnetic device with a leakage inductance to get the output current ripple to go away? 
So I, you know, the actual IG of T here and I out of T have DC plus some ripple, but you can actually make the ripple go away, make the delta I out, say, go to zero by um, tweaking the leakage inductances. And in the problem, this is done by actually changing the air gaps. So the problem has this E core with three gaps. And I, I forget where the windings are. I think they're on, they're on two of the three legs. <clears throat> so by choosing the gaps in each of the three legs, you can, in the right way, you can actually make one of the delta i's go away. And you can shift the delta i to be all in one winding or all in the other or, or distributed some in each. So it's kind of a cute thing. Um, I would suggest that when you solve the model for this with the L11 and L22 and all of that, that you write those things in the form that some, say, N1 squared will be over some effective reluctance, but make it be something in the form that has, that's a function of gaps. Whatever it is, I don't quote me. I don't think this is what the answer is, but um, write it in this this form. Let's see what it. I guess AC goes up here. Whatever it is, <laughs> uh, write it in terms of, of the gaps explicitly. That will simplify things when it comes time to do these last parts of this problem because ultimately you'd be solving for the gap length. So what you should be finding then is find uh, an equation for say delta I out is something that depends on these gap lengths and see if you can get that to go to zero. And I'll tell you, it will go to zero at some finite magic value of the gap that's not infinity or zero or anything like that. Okay. Any other questions? lecture today then. Um, so today we're talking about copper loss. Okay, so this is the resistance of the wire used to wind your magnetics. And it might seem like um, hard to talk very long about this subject, um, but it's actually going to take more than one lecture to do it. Um, so, uh, so I guess previously we've talked about core loss as uh, one of the major sources of loss in the magnetics. The copper loss is also an equally important source of loss. And um, I guess the, the, what we call the DC loss of a winding, or the traditional copper loss that we've modeled so far you know, throughout the course when we talk about efficiency and things, comes from the DC resistance of the wire. So we have so many turns of copper wire on, a, on our magnetic core, and you can figure out the resistance of that copper. Um, and what we get, we can then model that as some series resistor, and we call that the DC resistance. So we'll call this RDC. And the classic formula for that is that the resistance is the resistivity of the metal usually copper, times the length of the wire divided by the cross-sectional area of the wire. 
So I have some, say, round magnet wire. It has some area here, cross-sectional area, that's A, W, the area of the wire. It has some length. It is the length of the wire. And the copper has some resistivity rho. Okay? So if we have, um, say, in turns of wire on a core, and each turn of wire has some length that we call the mean length per turn, then the length, this LB would be the mean length per turn times the number of turns, and you can calculate the resistance of the wire. Um, here's some numbers for resistivity of copper. Um, at room temperature, the classic number you hear is 1.724 times 10 to the minus 6 ohm centimeters is the resistivity of copper. Really, this number has way too many digits, though. Um, uh, the, the resistivity of copper does vary with temperature. And for example, when we raise the temperature to 100 degrees C, this, the resistivity goes up to 2.3 times 10 to the minus 6 ohm centimeters. Um, OK, so it is a function of temperature. And as you heat up the wire, the, t the resistance goes up. So from this, we get a copper loss. Uh, it's written here as PCU, is this RMS current squared times the resistance. And uh, what we're going to talk about from now on is we're actually going to call this the DC copper loss, which is the RMS current squared times RDC, where this is RDC. So it's the resistance of the wire at DC. Okay, if this were the only loss we had, copper loss we had, then life would be pretty easy. But it's not. And so <clears throat> we get all of these problems when we put AC currents through our windings. Um, and the, the problems come really fundamentally from the skin effect. So we need to talk about that. Um, so the skin effect occurs from eddy currents in the wire. And we talked previously about um, eddy currents in the core um, that uh, when we put AC or changing flux through our core material, it induces electrical eddy currents in the core that cause power loss in the core. And really, it, the same thing happens to the wire. So when we put AC current through the wire, it will induce eddy currents in the wire just the same. And those eddy currents can be very significant and greatly increase the, the power loss in the wire itself. So here's a little drawing where we have um, current going this way through some wire. And really, I think I'm, I want to magnify this. Let's draw a magnified view of that. So in fact, I'm going to magnify it so much that you can't even see the edge of the wire. Okay, so we have some current going this way through the wire. And in, because of that current, we have a magnetic field around the current. And so I use the right-hand rule. The field goes like this. So it will go this way, magnetic field. And uh, that magnetic field will induce currents that oppose changes in the original, or that oppose changes in the field. Okay, so this is from Linz's law, and the same eddy current um, argument. So if we have a magnetic field going that way, it will induce currents that go this way. And on this side, it'll go like that. And these 
these induced currents flow to oppose changes in the magnetic field. So if the original current is AC, like let's write it I of T, so let's say some sinusoidal current at some frequency, then it will make a B field surrounding it at the same frequency, that is a sinusoidal B field. And that B field will induce currents in the conductor, in the wire itself, that flow in a direction to oppose changes in the field. And what that means is that the currents end up flowing in a direction to oppose the changes in the original current. That's the, the answer of how you keep the, current, the field from changing, is your currents cancel out the changes in the original current. And so these currents flow in the direction that tends to cancel out the current. And so when, when we put AC current down our wire, then we get AC currents that cancel this out, cancel our original current out. Now, <clears throat> so this drawing here shows, it's trying to illustrate that, but if we look at the boundaries of the wire then, what happens is that the eddy currents cancel the original current inside the wire, and this happens everywhere except on the surface. And what it does is it makes the current essentially all crowd on the surface. And another way to say this is that eddy currents prevent magnetic fields from penetrating electrical conductors. They, they flow in such a way to keep changing currents out and changing magnetic fields out of conductors. And so um, the current then distributes itself on the surface <coughs> only. Um, there's no current inside the conductor, and there's no magnetic field as a result inside the conductor either. Now, you can solve Maxwell's equations to see exactly what the current density does, and I'm, the next couple of lectures, if I went down that path, would be a major exercise in fields that I don't want this course to become. So I'm going to just explain this qualitatively and wave my hands, but we will get to real equations in a few minutes to at least state the, the result. But um, if you solve Maxwell's equations, what you find is that the current, here's a plot of the oops, current density going into the wire is a function of the depth in, into the wire. And the solution says that the current density is a decaying exponential function of distance into the wire. Um, in fact, let's draw that. <clears throat> so the current density, I'll call J of X, is some constant times E to the minus X over another constant. <clears throat> so here's kind of a blow up. Let's see. So say we have current flowing up this wire like this. What we find is that if we plot the current density, so here's x is zero, um, the current density is some kind of decaying exponential function of distance going into the wire. And it has a characteristic distance, kind of like the time constant, but the decay constant, called the skin depth or penetration depth delta. So so the current crowds on the surface. It has this decaying exponential function. You'll find another one on this side that'll do the same thing. And all the current flows on the surface, and there's very little on the inside. <clears throat> OK. 
Okay. Um, we can solve Maxwell's equations and find what the skin depth is. And here's the answer. This is supposed to be a radical over all of this. The skin depth or penetration depth is the square root of the resistivity of the material divided by pi, 3.14, times the mu or permeability of the material, which for copper, mu is just mu naught, basically, times the frequency. Okay? And you need to put all of these things in MKS units. Um, at room temperature, we can plug in the values for rho and mu. Um, and what we find is that the penetration depth or skin depth is seven and a half centimeters over the square root of the frequency in hertz, just for plugging the numbers in. <clears throat> okay, well, seven and a half centimeters seems like, you know, a wire that big is pretty big, but over the square root of frequency, you know, if we're talking 100 kilohertz or a megahertz, then this can get to be a pretty small number. So here's a plot of that. And uh, this lower line here is, is this formula. The upper line is at 100 degrees C with where we have a larger row. Um, so here's the, pin, the skin depth in centimeters versus the frequency. And for reference, I've noted here um, the diameters of different wires. So American wire gauge is what's used in the U.S. for copper magnet wire sizes. 20 gauge wire is about like hookup wire you use in the lab, and it can take a couple of amps. 30 gauge wire is getting pretty small, and 40 gauge wire is getting close to the thickness of hair, and it's very small. Um, so if you look here, the, the skin depth at 100 kilohertz is about like what, 33 gauge wire, which can take a fraction of an amp, and that's all. Okay, what do we do if when we're building a converter that's running at 100 kilohertz and we want, you know, 50 amps out of it? We need wire that's way up here. So we have wire that is many, many skin depths in thickness. Now, I would say that these frequencies, you know, in the scheme of things, really aren't all that large. People in the RF business have been working with skin depths for 100 years, and, uh, you know, they, they build things with gigahertz and up frequencies and deal with the skin depth. Um, so it isn't so much that we have super high frequencies, although it's the combination of frequency and power that is the issue. It's that we need conductors that can handle lots of amps. And I would also say that um, skin depth doesn't depend very strongly on frequency. It goes like one over the square root. So it's pretty weak dependence on frequency. And even at the 60 hertz business, they have problems with skin depth. Um, and the problem really isn't that the frequency is so large. Rather, it's that the conductors are so large because the currents are large. So, uh, you know, like these transmission lines, uh, 60 cycle transmission lines will have conductors that are this big around and there are many skin depths even at 60 hertz. There are a lot of skin depths and what they do when they build them is they don't even bother to put um, copper or aluminum conductors on the inside. That's all on the outside. The inside is, is a steel cable to support the weight of the conductor and the current doesn't flow there. Um, in large motors they sometimes have um, gas or water cooling that goes down the middle of the conductor. And you may as well cool it w that way and make the conductor hollow because there's no current flowing there anyway. So skin depth is an issue really because the current is high. All right. <clears throat> um, if we go back to this plot, There's one other important thing to say about this, and that is, okay, suppose we have a wire that's many skin depths thick. What is the resistance of the wire? And we can talk about an AC effective resistance that 
is based on the power loss you get when the current has this distribution. And so what you can do is, um, you know, the, the power loss density is J squared times the resistivity. It's like I squared R. And you can integrate that loss over the whole, um, the whole area of the wire to find the total power loss. And, what, and so the total power loss then corresponds to some effective AC resistance, where we can say that we have an effective AC resistance is found as the RMS current squared times RAC. And RAC is found by finding the, the um, total power loss. I'm sorry, this isn't the AC resistance, this is the loss. So RAC is the effective resistance that we would calculate um, with the same given RMS current flowing down the wire, but with the current distributing itself across the wire like this. And what you find is that that AC resistance is the, is the same thing you would calculate in a hollow tube. <coughs> and the hollow tube has has a thickness in its walls of one skin depth, and it's hollow in the middle, and then it has uniform current flowing through it. So the, if we plot J here, the current density, it has a, a uniform current density in, in that surface, or in, in this one skin depth um, of distance. So effectively the, the, um, the skin effect turns our conductors into hollow tubes literally, or pretty, pretty literally, and, and the RAC that we calculate um, is, uh, is rho times the length over the area, let's see, call it the effective area, where the effective area is, is just this area of this, this ring. So it's the area, what it's the outer circle minus the inner circle in, in area. Does that make sense? You follow that? So we are not using anymore the DC resistance? So we're not using the DC resistance. Well, okay, so it depends on the current. So if your current has a DC component and an AC component, then the DC component use the DC resistance. If it has an AC component, let's say as a sine wave at some frequency, then you calculate the skin depth at that frequency and then use this formula for the AC resistance. And then if, if the current has a Fourier series, then you do it for each harmonic in the Fourier series and add them all up. So that's the skin effect, and the next step I'd say is, I wish it were as simple as that, <laughs> but we have yet another problem that's called the proximity effect that is actually a corollary of the skin effect, and it's what happens when you have conductors next to each other, in proximity to each other. Um, they interact with each other because each conductor makes a magnetic field and that magnetic field affects the distribution of currents in nearby conductors. Um, the proximity effect in transformers can magnify the skin effect by orders of magnitude and it's a big problem. 
And so designing, say, efficient transformers and forward converters and things like that turns out to be pretty tough because of the not just the skin effect but the proximity effect. If, if we have a winding, a transformer winding, there are many conductors all wound together in a bundle and they affect each other and greatly raise their losses. So here's an example of that. And let's go to the next page. Let's suppose we have one conductor, and I'm just going to draw it to be square so it's, it's easy. So here's a conductor that um, has a square cross section. It looks like this. So there's current, say, coming out of the board. Current's going, flowing this way down the conductor and coming out of the board, and there's a net current I flowing down the conductor. Okay? Um, and then let's suppose we put another conductor next to it. And for now, let's not even put any current down that conductor. It's not even connected to anything. It's just a piece of wire sitting in space next to the first wire. What happens? Okay. Let's also suppose their thicknesses here are much much bigger than a skin depth. Okay, so we'll call this thickness, um, I don't know, H, and H is much greater than the skin depth. So what happens? Okay, well, the skin effect means that the currents want to flow on the surfaces of the wire. Um, so, say a skin depth maybe is this much. And this current I will, will want to flow on the surface. Now, if current that flows on this surface, say it all flows there, it will make a magnetic field. What? It's coming out of the board, so magnetic field goes this way. <clears throat> and that magnetic field will attempt to penetrate the next conductor because it's, it's nearby. And um, so we will get any currents induced in that conductor that will try to keep the magnetic field out of the conductor. And so they will flow in a direction to cancel out the magnetic field. And the way they have to flow then is this way, into the conductor, so that there's no magnetic field inside the conductor. And what you'll get is a current, we'll call it minus I, it's flowing in the opposite direction on the surface of the adjacent conductor. Okay? So the conductors that are near each other, they have equal and opposite currents to cancel the magnetic field. Now, the problem with this is that this conductor isn't connected to anything, and it has zero net current. And yet we've got a current minus I on the left-hand surface of it that's flowing this way. <clears throat> to get zero net current, what has to happen is the current has to return. And so we get plus I on the opposite surface. So that minus I and plus I add up to zero, and there's no net current in the conductor. So what... What happens if you put a net current I on this conductor then is that the nearby conductor gets minus I on its nearby surface and plus I on the opposite surface. And the total power loss that you get, well, you get the skin depth effect on the first conductor, but you get twice that much loss on the next conductor. Okay. The slide has a plot of, of that. <clears throat> Showing the exponential decay from the, the uh, skin effect. And so, um, <clears throat> so the proximity effect then is the loss on the adjacent conductor that has these two currents on their surfaces and you get three times the loss you would have 
thought from just the original conductor. Okay, let's think about an actual transformer. So suppose we have some core and we have some windings on the core and uh, there's a primary and a secondary. And for now, to keep the geometry simple, let's say the windings are just these rectangular cross-section things. Um, actually, this rectangular cross-section is some winding that goes around the core. I've just taken a cross-section, cut a cross-section here. And so what we're seeing is um, three, three turns of primary or three layers that are rectangular. And then we have three turns of secondary that carry equal and opposite current. So what does the skin effect make this do? Well, the first layer, its current will actually crowd on, on its surface. We have plus I flowing right there. Okay. Layer two, that what this plus I will make a magnetic field and layer two will have an equal and opposite current on its surface to keep that magnetic field from penetrating the conductor. And so it has a current minus I on its surface. But this, this second layer is supposed to have a net current of plus I. And we've got minus I flowing on the left-hand surface. So we have to get plus two I on the right-hand surface to, to get the currents to add up to I. Right? Okay. Then the next layer, we've got what? Plus 2i on the, sur the surface of layer 2. So the next layer has to have minus 2i on it. And then to get a net current of plus i here, we have to have plus 3i on the right hand side. So what's happening is that as we build up the layers, we get more and more currents on the surfaces. Um, and, you know, just one little I flowing through here makes, what, 2I and 3I on the third layer. The, the power losses, if you have I squared R in the first layer, the power loss you have in the third layer is 2 squared plus 3 squared. <coughs> what, 4 and 9, 13 times the power loss in the third layer that you had in the first layer. So this is growing geometrically, and the more layers you have, the more this proximity loss get. I mean, this proximity loss gets big very quickly. Okay, if we keep going, the third, the next layer, the primary or secondary, will have minus 3 on its surface to get a net minus i. We have to have plus 2 on the other side. So we'll have minus 2 on the next layer and plus 1. And finally, the, the last layer is just minus i on, its, on the surface there. <coughs> so the currents are building up to a high point in the middle between the primary and secondary windings and then they build back down until they get to the uh, outside of the winding. And there's a drawing of that showing the uh, exponential decay and the, um, with the proximity effect and the magnetic fields between the layers. Okay, we can estimate the proximity loss. So we use the formula. This RAC is basically related to RDC, but we approximate that the, uh, <coughs> the current only flows in the surface that is a conductor of thickness of one, one skin depth. So that effectively scales the DC resistance by a factor of the thickness here, H, divided by the skin depth. So it's crowding the current into just this one little part, one skin depth thick. 
here and you can just ignore the rest. So the DC resistant, the AC resistance is scaled by this factor. Okay, so if P1, the loss in the first, first layer is the RMS current squared times this resistance, then in layer two we'll have, we have, what, it goes like I squared R, so we'll have another P1 right here, and here we're going to have 2 squared times P1, so 4P1 from those, those currents. 4P1 here, and this will be 3 squared is 9P1 there, and so on. So each of these layers, um, <coughs> you know, ha has power losses that are building geometrically, and here's in fact the, the expression for layer M um, in terms of the DC resistance. So we can go add up the losses in each layer like this to, uh, to calculate the total loss. Now, what, the one thing I would say about this formula, it's the high frequency limit. As you make the, the thickness of the conductor much greater than a skin depth. And if you have conductor thicknesses that are close to a skin depth, then these, these exponential decays overlap and the formula is more complicated. But, and we'll talk about that probably next time. But as we go, um, as we get thick conductors, then the high frequency limit is in fact this number. So you can sum the series. Here's the sum for each layer. If you have a capital M total number of layers, you can add up the loss from each layer. And here's the sum. Um, we can compare that to what the DC resistance predicts. Um, so here's what we would predict if, if there was no skin effect. Here's what we predict from the proximity and skin effects. And the ratio of those we call F sub R. This is the factor by which the skin and proximity effects increase the loss. And it's the ratio of this, this sum to this number, and it turns out to be this. So it's a function of how many skin depths thick your conductor is and how many layers you have. Okay? And it goes like the number of layers squared, and it gets big fast. All right, that's a good stopping point for today. We have a bit more to go. We'll talk next time about calculating what, hap what really happens in a full transformer. Then. Okay, see you Friday.